welcome to the Right Take Podcast, news, ideas, and conversations at the intersection of politics and culture, a project of the David Horowitz Freedom Center. I will be your host, Mark Tapson. Greetings, listeners. Thanks for coming back. I am your cisgender white male host, Mark Tapson. That's how I identify. You know who you are, so I think we're all set. Today is going to be a little bit different. I'm used to talking with guests about topics from a political and or cultural viewpoint. There are a number of critical issues going on in the culture today, which I think it's important to talk about also from a psychological perspective, because it's one thing to talk about them from a political viewpoint, but it's another to look at policies or ideologies from the perspective of the mental and emotional impact that they have, especially on children and young people. Political and ideological movements always, in one way or another, target the younger generations because, obviously, they're the future. And if you can get your hooks into them while they're young, preferably the younger the better, and their minds are impressionable, then you can, to a great extent, mold that generation and steer it in the direction of your vision of the future and the generation after that and so on. So my guest today and I are going to approach things from that psychological point of view, I think it'll be an interesting diversion from the usual approach. One of those topics, for example, is the state of masculinity, which is a deep concern of mine, not least because I just had my first son three weeks ago. Well, technically speaking, my wife had him, and I'm glad it was her and not me. But even before then, the state of masculinity was of deep concern because I have daughters, and I want them to grow up in a world in which good, strong men thrive. It's a deep concern of mine also because, like the culture critic Camille Paglia says, it's a man's world and always has been and always will be. So as men go, so goes the rest of the world. If men are in crisis, and they are, then our very civilization is in crisis too, and it is. I feel that if you want a better world, and who doesn't, then it starts by making better men, not by kicking men to the curb and claiming that the future is female. Along those lines, I've been reading a very recent book called Of Boys and Men, Why the Modern Male is Struggling, Why it Matters, and What to Do About It by Richard Reeves. This book um, addresses a similar state of things described in a book from a few years ago called The Boy Crisis by Warren Farrell. The subtitle of that is almost exactly like the other book, Why Our Boys Are Struggling and What We Can Do About It. Um, Both those books are excellent in terms of describing the problem of the crisis of masculinity, though I don't always agree with their solutions. But that's a topic for another time, and I'd like to get one or both of the authors on the Right Take podcast to talk about it. In any case, the topic of toxic masculinity is on my mind. It's a serious one for our culture, and I'm going to get into it today with my guest. And along those lines, another topic I want to get into is our culture's insane push to sexualize our children in various ways, and the indoctrination of children into gender ideology. Call me uptight and heteronormative, but I think imposing crackpot gender ideology and inappropriate sexuality on children is a very bad idea. And I also believe that disparaging traditional masculinity is a damaging idea for boys and young men and for the culture that they occupy. So I want to explore those issues today as well as the damage that's been done to our children through the pandemic hysteria and even the threat to free speech, all of these from a psychological viewpoint. And I've got a great guest today at The Right Take who is perfectly suited to addressing those topics. So let me bring her on now. Stay with us. Now for something completely different, as the Monty Python comedy troupe used to say. Today we're going to get to politics and culture through some psychological insights from my guest, who is a clinical psychologist and the author of Nervous Energy, Harness the Power of Your Anxiety. It's a book which I have read, by the way, and that's not just something I say to flatter the guests, it's true. Uh, And we'll talk about that book a bit because it was useful to me, and I, I think it will be to many of you too. The author is a very familiar face in the media everywhere from television and podcasts to the New York Times and Vanity Fair. You may have seen her 
recently on a an episode of the Timcast podcast, Dr. Chloe Carmichael. Welcome to the Right Take podcast. Thank you, Mark. It's an honor to be with you. Oh, no, the feeling is mutual. Uh, thanks for being here. First, tell us a little bit about your book. I've read it, as I mentioned, so I know some about it, but give the listeners a, a snapshot of what it's about and how I can help them. Sure. So in a nutshell, the book Nervous Energy, Harness the Power of Your Anxiety is about the healthy function of anxiety, which is to stimulate preparation behaviors. And so as a clinical psychologist, I wrote the book to just offer some practical ways that people can do that, that they can use anxiety the way Mother Nature intended rather than having to automatically medicalize or let big pharma or even therapy come in when oftentimes anxiety is actually just part of a normal human experience that can be constructive if we know how to use it. Well, I know that anxiety is certainly a part of my personal experience. Um, <laughs> I sense it every time I start to do a podcast. Uh, so this book is is useful to me. I've actually had experience with uh, uh, and with panic attacks, uh, with a couple of them, I recognize them now when they start to happen. And actually, I know how to suppress them and all that. But I didn't know what they were, what they were in the beginning. I didn't know what was happening to me. Um, so anyway, I found uh, a lot about your book to be useful, a lot of interesting concepts in it, like mind mapping and uh, zones of control, uh, worry time, anchor statements, all these things uh, I thought were, were uh, useful to me. I don't consider myself a, a highly functioning individual like the, the type that you work with and um, which uh, this book largely addresses. But I confess that when I, when I come across advice to practice breath control and mindfulness techniques, um, which you, some of which you recommend in your book, I get uncomfortable because it feels to me like sitting and breathing or emptying my mind uh, Anything that kind of smacks of yoga feels like I'm not being productive. How do you convince people like me that techniques like this actually are productive and help people be even more so? Yeah, yeah, Mark, I think that's a good question. And I think you are a high functioning person, but I'm going to leave that one uh, where it is just for the moment. But but yeah, so when we think about mindfulness and breath control, like you're saying, a lot of people just naturally think, okay, that's new age woo woo stuff, right? Um, however, as a clinical psychologist, what I like to think about when it comes to, say, mindfulness is something called metacognition, metacognition, which is uh, basically thoughts about your thoughts. And so, for example, if you've ever had the experience of not realizing that you're really irritable until you hear yourself snapping at somebody and then you say, whoa, like there's my tone today. Like what's going on with me? And then it gives you pause and then you realize, okay, wow, I think I'm actually kind of still high strung because of an argument I had with my spouse earlier today. Wow. How about that? That's actually mindfulness right there. Metacognition. When we can have an awareness of our emotional state, sometimes we go into people pleasing mode, right? There's there's all kinds of, uh, or, you know, social competitive mode. Uh, we've all had the experience, I think, of being in these modes without realizing we're in them until we hear ourselves, you know, giving away the farm or whatever, because we're so into that people pleasing mode. Um, and so when we have mindfulness, when we can practice mindfulness in an intelligent way, which is one of the things I believe my book teaches people how to do, when we can increase our metacognition skills, we can actually just operate so much better throughout our daily life. <laughs> And you mentioned a technique called uh, th three-step breathing, I, I believe. Am I getting that right? Three-step breathing? It's the three-part breath. Yes, that's three close enough. Three-part breath. Yes, I knew I wasn't getting that right. Uh, yeah, yeah, thank close you. close enough. Um, how, how does that work? Because I actually uh, started using that even before today's podcast. So it's <laughs> it is actually helpful to me. Can you describe that process briefly? Yeah, it's really interesting. So many studies have shown that by learning to observe something like our breath, going through a little bit of a specific guided routine that we do with our breath, if we do it in this particular way, um, then by learning to practice observing our breath, 
what we're really doing is we are sharpening our powers of self-observation. And so by practicing observing something benign, like our breath, again, we get better at observing things like nuanced mental states, again, like noticing, you know, am I a little on edge today? Or am I in an over-accommodating mood today? Or, you know, whatever the case may be. And through, uh, through doing those breathing techniques, we, we get that benefit of self-observation skills if we do it the right way. Now, a lot of people also say when they do the three-part breath, they say, wow, that is so relaxing. I feel so present in the moment and all this stuff. And I tell them, you know what? That is wonderful. That is great. But it's actually just a side benefit. What we're really doing is we're building our metacognition skills. <laughs> Uh, one thing you mentioned in the book really leaped out at me. Uh, in fact, I'm going to quote directly from it here. You write that um, you write about doing the, tr trying out the exercises that you put in the book, and you say I recommend doing them on paper or at least digitally. Many high functioning people are used to doing things in their head and feel that they glean so much benefit just from reading the steps of an exercise that they don't actually do the exercise. That describes me in a nutshell because I'm um, a really bookish kind of nerdy person. But anyway, I feel like when I read it, that that's enough, that practicing the exercises is is kind of unnecessary, but it is necessary, right? Yeah. So when we read something and, you know, a lot of intelligent people, myself included, you know, we're, we're used to being able to skim something, we read it and we, we kind of mentally do the exercise and we get a lot of benefit out of it. But when we actually pick up a pen and write down the responses and do the exercise on paper, it forces our brain to slow down. And so if we, even though we can process the information quickly without writing it down, if we slow down and we write through the exercise, some of the exercises ask you to answer questions or do steps. And if instead of just doing them in your head, you write them down and you do them on paper, it actually engages more regions of your brain than if you just mentally do them. So you literally are processing them in a deeper, broader, neurological level by writing them. Moreover, when we write things down, as opposed to just thinking them through, we have a uh, a, a record of what we've done. And then if we look at it later, this is why if you say look at an old journal entry or look at an old mental note you wrote to yourself at a conference or whatever, um, you see your handwriting, you see the pen, it flashes you back to that moment of when you made that note. And it becomes what psychologists call an environmental cue. And it helps to take you back to that moment in time and connect you more deeply with that learning at that moment. So there's a lot of benefits to actually writing things down if, if people can find the time. That totally makes sense to me. Well, I think there's a lot about the book that that uh, made sense to me and seemed very useful. And I expect that it will continue to be useful to me. Are you working on a new book? Well, thank you so much for, for that, Mark. I really appreciate that. Um, I'm actually considering, there's a couple of different types of books that I have in mind. Um, you know, it's funny, this is totally different from a book about anxiety. Um, but part of me has even been thinking about writing a book for parents of children that are going through um, confusion about their gender. <laughs> because I've had so many, believe it or not, friends that have had children, you know, where it's like the, the child went to school and next thing they knew, like teachers, fellow students, whatever. And, and the child, you know, suddenly believes, you know, that they are, quote, non-binary or whatever the case may be. And these poor parents have been told, you know, would you rather have a dead daughter or a live son? You know, and, and they, they've, they've been given what to use the big phrase today, misinformation, um, you know, about these things. And so I've honestly been thinking, I've been giving so much just private thoughts and support to friends that need ways that they can talk to their children about the truth about, you know, just who the child is and how to support the child and love the child, but to do it through a lens of truth and reality. Um, I've been looking at 
actually maybe writing something small about that, though. My my hope is that that cultural moment may be, may be starting to pass a little bit. I think people are finally waking up from wokeness on some level. So maybe I won't have to write that book. <laughs> I have a feeling it will be necessary for a while, and it sounds like, uh, I mean, it's a very important topic. It's one I actually wanted to get to in just a little bit. Um, so I encourage you to, you know, elaborate on that, make it more than just uh, something short. But I think it's it's it deserves book-length treatment. I know that you're a mom, and I'm a parent too, and uh, so things that things in the culture that affect our children are of um, great concern to us. Um, Speaking of which, let's let's talk about a few of the events and trends that I, I think are happening in America today that are unique in, in American history that are impacting our youth in what I think is a serious, dangerous way. And one example that I think probably leaps to everybody's mind is the recent pandemic lockdowns and the masking. Um, we all now know, and many of us knew as these things were happening, that not only were none of these uh, totalitarian protective measures effective at all, but we're finding out now that just how harmful they were on children. Can you tell us what, for example, the effects of the masking on children were? Oh, my goodness. Yeah, Mark, it's really heartbreaking. I'll just tell you, I'm, I'm sitting right here right now in the free state of Florida. Um, I, I lived in New York. I moved there in 2001 as a young Woman, and um, I, I was there, and I was very happy there until very recently, um, in 2020, they wanted to mask my then three-year-old, and he had been home with with my husband and me, you know, for his his whole life. We hadn't wanted to put him in a program, but we had planned that when he was three, almost four, he it would be the right time for him socially to go into a program and you know be kind of more constantly around groups of children all day. And um, at that particular moment, you know, the the governor had said that even three year olds would have to wear a mask. And uh, boy, I tell you, I've never felt that mama bear feeling so strongly. And um, I just I remember I remember just um, being in tears, telling my husband, we have to move. We have to move. I, I cannot do this to him. So, yeah, I, I feel it very viscerally. Um, so just to go through <laughs> a litany of reasons why, um, as if we should need, you know, anyone to as need a psychologist to explain, you know, why masking children uh, is is a problem. So when we when we mask, obviously we cover up our mouth, and children look at lips as a way to learn about language and learn about how to make sounds. Children also look at moving objects and that holds their attention. So it also just focuses them on how to make the sounds as well as on what is being said. Moreover, when children smile or frown, obviously we cannot see it if they are wearing a mask. And Children, they're, the very young children especially, their self-esteem and their sense of identity is formulating even more so than they're, what they're conscious of. They're not a three-year-old not sitting there consciously thinking about forming you know, his social identity or self-esteem. However, when that child smiles or frowns and the adults around him respond to him. They say, oh, Junior, you sure are having fun with those blocks or, oh, look at that frown. What's the matter? The child doesn't even realize it consciously, but part of what's happening there is he's getting the message that there are adults around him who notice and care about him and will kind of buffer the world and help it all to make sense for him. And that gives him a feeling of security and emotional regulation. When children's faces are covered, and adults cannot respond to facial expressions because they cannot see them. Um, I'm very concerned about what that would do to a child's sense of identity um, over time. Moreover, I mean, Mark, I'll, I'll talk all day. So uh, I have more reasons, but I'm just going to pause for a moment so I don't end up on a soapbox here. <laughs> No, feel free. I mean, I think a lot of people do recognize that, you know, that what you just mentioned is one of the effects. What What's another one that another way that children have been kind of stunted by the masking? 
Yeah. So, I mean, another one is even just simply learning to recognize and and read and respond to facial expressions to be guided by them, right? Um, if we don't learn to to read them. Also, I'm concerned about um, what's called the facial feedback hypothesis in emotion, which is, you know, we've all heard, if you smile for two minutes, it'll improve your mood or whatever, right? Um, so making facial expressions connects us physically to what we're feeling. And part of the reason we make expressions as well is to socially communicate with others. And again, if you're not used to getting any response to your facial expressions, they serve no social utility because your face is covered up. My concern is, you know, you might be less inclined to make them. And then you would, you know, potentially experience this emotional flattening. And even before the pandemic, everybody was concerned about kids and depression and anxiety. And, you know, they're being lost in their phones and not doing eye contact and not being social enough, right? And then we go and obstruct one of the primary ways, especially that children who maybe are not as verbally sophisticated would have to um, communicate. Um, moreover, uh, there's something called mirror neurons and mirror neurons would, you know, be relevant not only to children, but also to adults. So mirror neurons, just like the name sounds, is a neuron cell in your brain that will mirror whatever it sees. So Mark, if you and I are looking at each other, and even if I'm feeling very sad, but you put on a big smile because you're happy about something, my mirror neuron actually smiles. It, it makes the same action as if I were smiling. And that is the neurological underpinning of empathy. It's how I'm hardwired to literally feel on some small level to register physically what you are feeling. That's the mirror neuron activity. So my mirror neuron activity is obviously interrupted if I cannot even see a face to respond to, um, you know, same as you. And for you and I, of course, we're adults, so we can even kind of see and read and get our information somewhat other ways through other cues. But children, they're actually acquiring this information. So I'm really disturbed by, by us withholding that normal facial stimulus from them. And not only the uh, the whole masking um, problem, but what about the isolation of the lockdowns and school closures? What what impact do those have on the development of children? Oh my goodness! Yeah, I mean, again, even before the pandemic, people were very concerned about kids being in their phone, being in all this virtual world. You know, children, obesity because they're not active, they're not you know connecting with others as much. Um, you know, I, I, all of these things we were concerned about at be, before, and then we go and we literally tell them, go sit in your room all day in front of a, you know, computer for eight hours. And it's not even just young children that I'm worried about there. Adolescents, right? They're becoming conscious of of dating, of of flirting, of of little sly smiles here and there. You know, little little small ways that that we learn to connect and to communicate with others, even nonverbal things that we don't even fully register, right? Like a slight parting of the lips, you know, um, small things that that we use to connect with one another and to send and receive social signals of attraction, which is part of what adolescents are beginning to learn about. Um, they're not even in the same room, right? And even if they were in the same room, if they're covered up with a mask, I, I just, I really worry about how they are supposed to 
develop the social graces and subtleties and nuances of, of approach and understanding each other, um, much less even the very basics of, of learning to smile at one another and greet each other. Um, uh, I'm very concerned about all of this and, or even just reading faces from far away. You know, you see a group across the playground. Is it okay to approach or is it not the right time? How to choose your moments? How can kids learn any of this if they're not even in the same room or if everybody's wearing a mask? And then there's the whole impact on on teenagers and their depression, which is already a serious issue. But as I understand it, suicides among young people uh, pretty much skyrocketed during the pandemic and after. So that's that's a whole issue, too, right? Absolutely. So social support is actually a protective factor, a resiliency factor in all kinds of mental illness, right? And so, you know, again, masking yourself feeling you have to keep six feet away from other people, everybody else being masked, all these things, I would hardly say, you know, that that's going to facilitate social support. Um, Another aspect of depression is actually helplessness or worthlessness, a sense of worthlessness. And so again, if, if we're telling people, you can cover up your face and it will be totally fine. And, you know, if you have a long face, you know, why the long face, you know, the old expression or, you know, let me see your smile or, you know, even just that simple thing of like I was mentioning earlier, feeling seen, feeling heard, all those things um, where we're decreasing somebody's sense of self-efficacy that if, if they smile and they just put on a confident face, you know, that that they can connect with others or just the sense of feeling valued and necessary by your community. At the same time, we're saying you can stay home. It doesn't matter. And by the way, if you do show up, please cover your face. I just think on some level that has to impact somebody's sense of worth, especially children and teenagers who have a less stable sense of worth. Absolutely. And I'm afraid that we haven't seen the end of the lockdowns and masking because those were tools that I think totalitarians and authority learned or very effective uh, during the pandemic. And I think they'll trot those out whenever they uh, feel the need to control the populace. So I don't think we've seen the end of that. Um, Moving on to another topic I wanted to discuss with you, and that's free speech. Another aspect of the, the, the whole pandemic hysteria was this clampdown on as you you mentioned earlier, the so-called misinformation uh, or disinformation on social media. And that just seemed to me to be kind of an extension of cancel culture in that people who dared question the official narrative about COVID were either shut down entirely or shadow banned, or they had their posts tagged with fact checks. They were demonized as conspiracy theorists or even threats to society. And that's not, that's not just coming from the government alone is, or from big tech companies, increasing numbers of young people now seem to favor limits on free speech and they see it as a tool of fascism. So what, what is the impact on people mentally and emotionally when their freedom of expression, their freedom of speech is curtailed or ended or when they're silenced by uh, a bullying cancel culture? Yeah, that's an interesting segue, Mark, right? So to as as what we're doing, of course, as you said, is we're sort of changing topics away from the face masks and then on to the subject of free speech, but they're actually very linked, right? So even wearing a face mask, it's it's rather depersonalizing, right? It's harder to recognize people. There's less of a sense of individualism and uh, you know, focus on expression, right? Of course when when you're literally masking yourself um and and i think you're right it's really disturbing the way that you know big government so to speak is is using those masks in many ways to almost muzzle people right is 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 the way that people would refer to that sometimes is that they felt like they were being muzzled um, by that. And certainly, I, I think that free speech is extremely important to mental health. Um, it's, it's one of the ways that we exchange and develop ideas, right? It's, it's the way that we 
even actually to the point of social connection again, how can we feel truly socially supported within our community if we can't even tell people the truth about how we really feel? It's almost the opposite of social support to walk around feeling like I better keep my cards close to the vest um, or else I could be canceled. Moreover, to this concept of, quote, safe spaces, how am I even truly supposed to feel safe around others? Now, I'll feel safe most anywhere because I'm a pretty resilient person. But just for the sake of argument, how would a person really feel, quote, safe when they're in an environment where it's explicitly stated that you're not allowed to express certain viewpoints. So me as a woman, I'd rather know if I'm around a bunch of people that think women are not as intelligent or women should, you know, be whatever. Um, I would not want to outlaw people from saying that. That wouldn't cause me to feel like I was safe. I would feel safe more just knowing I can pick and choose who I want to be with based on how they actually feel. Yeah, suppressing people's opinions doesn't make those thoughts or opinions go away. It just sort of drives them underground in a way where they could conceivably do more damage. And like you said, it's better to to hear those opinions and thoughts out in the open where you know what you're dealing with. Um, So would you say that people need that freedom of expression in order to make them feel whole, uh, to feel validated uh, in society, not just in their opinions, because people might not agree with their opinions, but just validated in their right to have their own opinions and to have the freedom to express them. Absolutely. So when we put our words, our, our thoughts into spoken language, it actually increases our sense of personal control, right? That's one of the reasons why people pay money to go to a therapist that will help them kind of coax them um, into taking what is inside and, and speaking it, right? I mean, honestly, for all the talk on the left about speaking your truth and, you know, feeling empowered and how important that is, right? I'm just, I'm stunned that so many psychologists, especially at such a left-leaning profession, um, you know, seem brainwashed into this idea that, um, that we should discourage people from saying what's on their mind, even if, what they're saying is, you know, totally backwards and totally wrong. We've all had the experience of saying something. And only as we say it, do we realize how foolish it sounds, right? We say, wait a minute, as I say that aloud, that doesn't make any sense, right? So we need to allow people to say things so that they can, you know, either be persuaded or, you know, kind of hear it and have a natural evolution of thought themselves. But also, again, to this point of individualism and autonomy, being able to know that you have a right to speak your own mind. For goodness sakes, when we start policing what people can say, that's very close to policing what people can think. And if we're policing what people can think, we're really policing who people can be. So, I mean, absolutely to the point of, of, of freedom of speech mattering in terms of of a person's sense of personal efficacy, which again is actually another um, resiliency factor in psychology. We want to increase somebody's sense of personal efficacy and self-awareness. So um, definitely free speech and mental health go hand in hand in my opinion. Let me throw another topic your way. The impact on children of what I and many, many other people see as our culture's alarming push to instill or awaken a sexual consciousness in children very at a very young age, as young as pre-kindergarten, whether it's by introducing them to sex education before they even know their ABCs or discussing sexual practices that they are not old enough to process or understand or indoctrinating them about gender ideology, which you brought up earlier as a 
potential topic of a book or exposing them to sort of the exaggerated caricatured sexuality of drag queens. I can't imagine that there's anything positive or healthy for kids about introducing any of these things to them before they are mature enough to grasp any of this. Am I, is that a typical kind of parental overreaction? Oh, no, no. <laughs> I I totally agree with you. I mean, for me, even just going back, I was in graduate school not that long ago, you know, maybe 12 years ago or some 10, 10, 12 years ago. And at that point in time, one of the things, you know, that was being discussed at that time was um, I, I think homosexuality was coming out of the DSM, you know, as a disorder. And, you know, there was a lot of talk about, you know, respecting the rights of adults, you know, and 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 as well as teenagers and, and their sexuality to be able to do what they wanted to do, whether it be with same sex or opposite sex. But even embedded within that discussion was a recognition of the concept that there is a male and that there is a female, right? And that, that you know, one, one can be attracted to a male or to a female and it's okay, whichever, you know, you're attracted to was, was really what, what we were learning about and championing at that point in time. And at this point now, the APA, the American Psychological Association, I think has just, you know, completely gone off the rails, you know, to your point when we're now looking at sexualizing children, I mean, that to me is, is really, it's a, it's a projection. It's the adults' sexual thoughts and beliefs, et cetera, you know, that they are then trying to um, filter onto and teach and, you know, in your word, indoctrinate um, into young children, especially, I think, when we start looking at problems of reality, right, about suggesting to them that, that they can, quote, change their sex, right? Um, even just being simply honest, like it's not even an appropriate conversation with a five-year-old anyway. But even let's suppose you're talking about a 15-year-old. Most 15-year-olds, and I, 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 I have some personal experience with this because of some friends, various friends that I've had that have been, have had children that have gotten, you know, caught up in this they don't even understand that what it means to be, quote, trans, you don't become a man or a woman, you become a male or female, which is what you're born as, that has done everything they can to take on the cosmetic appearance of a man or of a woman, or has done everything they can to mimic the hormonal profile of a man or of a woman. But that it's not at all the same as becoming a man or a woman. And it's it's shocking to me that anyone looks at it as, you know, liberating or forward thinking to to blur and confuse this. I mean, it was only a, maybe I, not that long ago that women were getting um, very vocal about the fact that there needed to be more women involved in medical studies, right? Because we were saying, hey, look, women's bodies respond differently to drugs, et cetera. You can't just test the men. You can't just put men in the clinical trials. You have to have women in them, right? Because we were acknowledging that, of course, women, you know, we're, we're a different, you know, a different uh, sort, if you will. Now, as now to your point, though, Mark, about children, when we're looking at young children, they are prone to what psychologists call magical thinking, right? Right. You know, uh, when I was five years old, I wanted my parents to turn me into a bird for my birthday. Right. And I, I was shocked and dismayed, you know, that they couldn't do this. I have my own five year old now and he has an active imagination as he should. Um, it would be so detrimental as he's trying to acquire a grasp on reality to start to suggest to him that the basic facts of life, uh, that he's a boy, for example, um, should be muddied, would be very detrimental. And then when we get to teenagers, part of the work, part of the healthy developmental process of a teenager actually involves trying on different social identities, right? They are transitioning. Every teenager is transitioning. They're transitioning into an adult that um, is going to have 
a, a more sophisticated, more options in terms of who they want to be and how they want to present. And for them to play with those identities is actually a normal, healthy developmental process. However, it's the job of adults to guide them through that process with support and reality, right? So, I mean, again, I personally would not want to even encourage a, a teenage boy to start uh, masquerading as a teenage girl. But even if he were going to do that, I would want to make it very clear to him that what he's doing is he's masquerading as a girl. That doesn't mean that he is a girl. And I'm really shocked that we have to discuss this. Along those same lines of, of gender confusion, here's another topic, the crisis of masculinity, by which I mean boys and young men who are struggling in every way, economically, struggling academically, they're struggling to find meaning and purpose in a post-feminist world. I know that you um, are the mother of a boy, and I just had a son, so this is a of serious concern to both of us, I guess. Uh, what about the cultural messaging that is bombarding boys and young men with the idea that their very nature, their ma the very masculinity is toxic? We all know this expression now, which has become an, a kind of a household phrase overnight a few years ago, toxic masculinity. Uh, what about this messaging that tells them their masculinity is nothing but a, a false culturally constructed mask that oppresses them? and that they need to remove that mask and instead act more like the stereotype of females. In other words, be more vulnerable, more in touch with your emotions and all that. What are we doing to boys and men with messaging like that? Well, I, I think that's a very powerful question, Mark. Um, so, however, <laughs> thanks to your wonderful producer, I do want to go back and say one more quick thing, though, about the 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 trans situation. So another another thing that I just think is important in the context of this conversation about, you know, trans issues is that people who are who are actually, um, you know, display the secondary sex characteristics of both male and female who are legitimately born where their body is going to display, um, say, breasts and a penis or something like that. Um, I've actually personally worked with an intersex person. And it's very important to note that although a person might be born um, displaying the secondary sex characteristics of, say, both a male and a female, that person is actually male or female. That person either produces eggs or they produce sperm. And it's actually very important to that person, typically, to have it understood that that person is a female and you cannot take that away from them or that that person is a male and you cannot take that away from them. And I think that largely people who are in that community of genuinely being people who are born with the secondary sex characteristics of both male and female really do not like <laughs> being mixed up in the situation of somebody who is born a male, who has the secondary sex characteristics of a male, and for their own, you know, just personal preferences, want to masquerade as a woman to be, you know, lumped in together and to have, quote, intersex people um, mixed in with that, I think is actually cheapening and degrading to people who are actually have, have fought long and hard to make it known that they are female, even though they may display certain sex, uh, secondary sex characteristics, you know, of, of the opposite sex. Um, now to, to your point about <laughs> boys and toxic masculinity. Yes, indeed. I do. I have a son. I have a husband. <laughs> I have wonderful men in my life. And this discussion of toxic masculinity, um, really does start to pain me because I think that there's so much in society that we need from men. Um, you know, that we, we need the masculine strength, even the stoicism, the sense of competitiveness, um, all of these things that are 
you know, being cast as so, so toxic without really any recognition of, of the positive things that men have done for us. Never mind as well, of course, as you alluded to, the fact that men have a higher rate of suicidality, they have a higher rate of drug abuse, they, you know, have lower literacy rates, there's a literacy crisis in boys, you know, they're, they're not graduating college and high school at the same rate as girls. Um, and yet there seems to be zero discussion of looking at how we can support and lift up those boys. In fact, if anything, you know, again, this discussion of toxic masculinity, it's like we're squashing the very same strengths that those young boys need to get themselves out of these problems. Yes, absolutely. Well said. And speaking of toxic masculinity, you and I were talking the other day and you introduced me to something I had not heard of, actually, which is a toxic femininity, uh, which is not something you ever hear people talk about. What is that about? Absolutely. So toxic femininity, uh, I mentioned as we spoke this term called Marianismo. So I think most of us have heard of machismo in the Latin culture, the, you know, kind of uber masculine side machismo, which is not even a, always a bad thing, by the way. Again, um, a man who's a, who's a little macho, um, is, is not always the worst thing in the world. In fact, sometimes it can be, you know, great. Um, and then, but in its, in its extremes, certainly machismo, you know, can, can be dark. Same thing for Marianismo, which in, Spanish and the Latin culture is the counterpart to machismo. And that Marianismo is uh, going back to, um, I, I think, the Virgin Mary, right? Um, this kind of exaggerated form of the female suffering, victim, martyr, you know, weakness um, would kind of lend itself to, say, passive aggression or even a manipulative attachment to the victim role, for example, false claims of sexual harassment, right? So another one in my blogs is the dark side of Me Too, um, you know, which is where women for their own personal gain will, you know, threaten or make up something about sexual harassment or, um, you know, maybe they've had regrettable sex. And instead of just wanting simply taking personal responsibility for that, they'll, you know, convert it into um, an accusation of rape, which is awful. I've, I've spoken for uh, an organization called Families Advocating for Campus Equality, which is working to protect these young men from being what is, quote, Title IX. It has now become a verb to Title IX somebody, which is, I mean, if a young woman accuses a man of rape in a Title IX school, many times it's just part of the policy that that young man is immediately removed from school while some kangaroo court of you know, college professors who are skewing way left, of course, you know, just independently decide this poor young man's fate. So to me, that would be a great example of toxic femininity um, of this, you know, girl power gone crazy. But both of these concepts, toxic masculinity and toxic femininity, they're both sort of misleading, aren't they? Because neither one uh, is actually inherently toxic. They're, they're kind of value neutral. Wouldn't you say like, uh, uh, the traditional masculine traits like aggression and competitiveness, for example, could be either positive or negative, depending on how they're directed and to what extent, right? Absolutely. Um, I just, I think that when people talk about toxic masculinity, a lot of times what they're doing is they're assuming that most any display of masculinity is in and of itself toxic. I mean, it's oftentimes from the same crowd that, you know, utters phrases like dead white male, as if that's, you know, supposed to be, or, you know, cishet white male or whatever, as if that in itself is supposed to convey or, you know, connote that there's something obviously 
wrong with that person. I mean, the people who talk about toxic masculinity, I've never heard them talk about positive masculinity. It just, it seems to me like it's becoming a catch-all term to just describe masculinity. (laughs) Yes, I've been saying that for years, actually, which is that uh, the people who complain about toxic masculinity never talk about any positive kind of, of masculinity. Uh, so it's 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 very demonizing, I think. Um, one final question, Dr. Chloe. Our culture, now I know you're a psychologist, not a psychiatrist, but our culture seems to have lost its damn mind. If you could put the culture on a couch <laughs> and think of one thing that you might prescribe for it, besides maybe electroshock therapy, what would you prescribe to get our society and our culture back to some semblance of sanity? Well, that's a very interesting question. So one of my other blogs is called Political Polarization is a Psychology Problem. And one of the things I talk about in that article is something called reflective listening, which is actually a couples therapy technique. Um, And what we do in reflective listening is when we hear somebody that's expressing something that, you know, rubs us the wrong way, instead of just responding by trying to refute it, We first simply reflect it back, just saying, repeating back to them what they said in a tone of voice that conveys to them that we recognize that on some level, a reasonable person, you know, could have somehow gotten this idea. And then we say our piece of how we feel about the issue. And the person then reflects back what we said. And so that is just, it's a, it's a basic, you know, listening and understanding technique. That's one thing. And then the second thing I would prescribe, of course, um, is for people to remember that there is a healthy function to anxiety, which is to stimulate preparation behaviors. And so if people are feeling like they don't like the way the world is going, um, then the healthy preparation behavior that should stimulate for them is, you know, get out and vote, get out and talk to your neighbors, make sure you bring some people to the voting booth with you, maybe think about running for local office yourself, take that angst that you're feeling, and, you know, use it to make a donation or talk to a friend and get involved and do something. Well, that's a great answer. And I think it's probably a great place to stop. Dr. Chloe Carmichael, thanks you so much for coming on to the Right Take podcast. It was fun and enlightening. I hope we can do it again soon. I want to remind everybody to check out your book, Nervous Energy, Harness the Power of Your Anxiety, wherever fine books are sold. Dr. Chloe, thanks a lot. Thank you so much. Great to be with you, Mark. The Right Take with Mark Tapson is a project of the David Horowitz Freedom Center and Front Page Magazine. Unauthorized reproduction of this podcast without express written consent is prohibited.